Hi, in this second lecture of the Security Engineering course, we're going to follow through on threat models and on security policies. The design hierarchy that we described in the first lecture starts off from threats, what are we trying to stop? And it then moves on to security policy, how are we trying to stop it? And in later lectures, we're going to go on and look at the mechanisms that we'll use, cryptography, access control, and so on. First of all, let's tidy up a bit of terminology. When I talk about a system, I might be referring to a product or component, such as a PC or a smart card or a phone. Um, I might be referring to some products plus operating system comms and infrastructure, such as your phone, the servers that it talks to back at Android or Apple or whatever, and infrastructure, such as the App Store. I may be talking about the above plus applications. I may be talking about the above plus internal staff, such as the staff who work for the companies who provide the applications on which you rely. Or I may be talking about the above plus customers and external users. And a common failing is that people draw policy too narrowly. They think only of the hardware and ignore the operating system, or they ignore the applications, or they ignore the people. So let's tidy up terminology on that. By a subject, I mean a physical person. A person can also be a legal person, such as a firm or a charity or a government department. And when I talk about a principle, I might mean a person, a piece of equipment, such as a laptop or a smart card or a phone. I might talk about a role, such as the, the branch manager of the bank or the officer of the watch on a ship. Or I might talk about a complex role, such as either Alice or Bob, or Bob deputizing for Alice. And we're going to talk later about separation of powers, and then we may require a little bit more precision, because sometimes you need to distinguish Bob's smart card representing Bob who's standing in for Alice from Bob using Alice's card in her absence. Because if Bob and Alice are the two people in the branch who have to work together to authorize a transaction over a million dollars, you don't want Bob to be able to impersonate Alice easily. More terminology. Secrecy is a technical term. Uh, by that, we mean mechanisms that limit the number of principles who can access information. Examples are cryptography and access controls. Privacy is a more human-oriented term. It means control of your own secrets, or if you're a lawyer, informational self-determination. Confidentiality is more of a corporate term. It's an obligation to protect someone else's secrets. So if you're a doctor, you've got an obligation of confidentiality as part of your employment contract with your practice or your hospital. And so your medical privacy is protected by your doctors of obligation of confidentiality. And the relationship of the doctor with the patient and with the hospital are two different things. Sometimes, unfortunately, they can clash. More on terminology. Anonymity is about restricting access to metadata. It's got various flavors. Um, for example, not being able to identify subjects, uh, being able to post on Twitter using a pseudonym, being able to have um, assets on a Bitcoin blockchain um, identified only by a public key rather than by your name. It can also mean not being able to link actions. It might mean having separate uh, separate records for the different prescriptions that your medical practice has written about you uh, because your entire medical history all linked up together is very difficult to anonymize whereas individual prescriptions might be fairly easy to protect in this way another concept is integrity and the integrity of an object lies in its not having been altered since the last authorized modification um, some of you may have used checks on bank accounts, certainly your parents are likely to have done. A check is basically a letter to your bank saying, please pay so much money out of my account to such and such a person. And a check um, is considered to be authentic by the banking system um, if it is um, drawn on your account and signed by you. In other words, it has integrity, it's not been altered, nobody has changed the pay or the amount. And also, um, if it was signed in the last 180 days, or in some countries, 90 days. In other words, it's sufficiently fresh, that the date isn't too old. And so an authentic object 
is an object with integrity plus freshness, as with a, with, with a, a check drawn on a bank account. And when we're talking about authentication protocols, we consider a user to be authentic if they have authorized or authenticated themselves within the current run of the protocol. In other words, your session hasn't timed out yet. And this also carries the, uh, the baggage of um, integrity plus freshness. It means that you're speaking to the right principle. Now, the hardest, perhaps, of all the technical terms that we use in security engineering is trust. And this has several meanings. Colloquially, trust is a warm, fuzzy feeling. You trust your doctor because he's a nice old um, fellow in his 50s and he's got a bedside manner and he's got certificates on his wall and a stethoscope hung around his neck. So you, you feel comfortable spilling out your medical secrets to him. The military definition is somewhat harsher. It is this, that a trusted system or component is one that can break my security policy. Now, when you stop to think about it, the two have got a huge amount of overlap between them because you trust your doctor in the sense that you tell him all your embarrassing medical secrets and thereby you put him in a position to break your security policy uh, by chatting in the golf club about what's wrong with you if he were um, so careless or wicked as to do that. But the, the reason that we prefer using the second definition rather than the first one is that it's one that we can reason about. It's one about which we can make formal statements and one about which we can prove theorems. If we can state a security policy precisely, we should be able to work out which systems, which components are those that can break it. There are two corporate spins on this, though, for which you should be aware. Um, for many companies, a trusted system means one that I can insure. Um, if your insurer says that it's okay to use uh, Gmail or um, Exchange Online for email, then that's fine. If something goes wrong, then you can make an insurance claim, and so that's good enough. And within companies, when people are making management decisions, very often they're looking out for their own interests as well as the company's interests. And so for them, a trusted system is one that won't get me far when it breaks. And as I've said, I'm going to use the second of these definitions, the defense industry definition. And one way to remember this is that if you've got a GCHQ person selling keys to the Russians, uh, then they are trusted, but not trustworthy. Um, assuming their action is unauthorized. Of course, if they're doing it with their employer's knowledge in order to set the Russians up, um, then more fool the Russians. And this brings us to the main topic of this lecture, which is security policy. A security policy is a succinct statement of protection goals, typically less than a page of normal language, which is used by the system provider to negotiate the protection goals um, with the customer. Now, once you have got the policy agreed, you can then refine that. And you will typically see also a protection profile, which is a detailed statement of protection goals in dozens of pages of semi-formal language, or at least technical language. And then a security target could be a detailed statement of protection goals applied to a particular system which gives you specification for functionality and testing of access controls, cryptography, logs, and so on and so forth. Now, many people have got strange ideas about security policy, and this is the kind of rubbish that you see in uh, poorly run companies. One, this policy is approved by management. Two, all staff shall obey this security policy. Well, what do they say you? Uh, what do they say to you? Then three, here's the nub. Data shall be available only to those with a need to know. But what does that mean? Who needs to know what? And four is again meta. All breaches of this policy shall be reported at once to security. But by whom? By the system? By individuals? By victims? By perpetrators? I mean, th there is so much obviously wrong with this policy that it's hard to know where to start. It's not something that you can use as a basis for negotiating a system design with your customer uh, or for um, figuring out um, how it will deal with the threats that you have come to understand during your requirements capture process. So that's how not to do it. In order to see how we should do it, we're going to now look at three security policies. All of them assume an insider threat, 
which can be either a disloyal employee, someone who's got fed up with you or someone who has been bribed or blackmailed by the other side, or equivalently, it could mean malware on their laptop. Uh, you don't know which, and um, you have to assume that either could be the case. Now, the three cases that we're going to look at are first an intelligence agency um, where the um, bad insider might seek to tell the opponents or the press what the agency is up to. Um, our example would be Ed Snowden's uh, whistleblowing disclosures that we discussed in the last lecture. In a health system, um, an insider might want to look at sensitive personal information such as the records of celebrities, of sports figures, politicians, and so on. And in a bank, an insider is probably going to try and steal money, although there are other cases where somebody in a bank might be looking for information and that would throw them into the second category rather than the first. But in each case, what we're going to try and do is to limit the damage that a bad insider can do, regardless of whether that bad insider is a bad person or some bad software sitting um, on some client or server within the trust boundary. Our first policy example is the multi-level secure system. Now, these systems are widely used in government and they're the main system that's used to defend large caches of intelligence data, such as the wiretap data that NSA and GCHQ collect. And the doctrine goes back to President Roosevelt in 1940, as America was getting ready to join World War II. And the basic idea can be summarized as saying that a clerk who's got a secret clearance can read documents at confidential and at secret, that is at lower levels and at the same level, but not at a higher level such as top secret. And the idea is that the, the stuff that you really want to be closely held, you stamp top secret or um, above top secret, and you restrict that to a small number of people whom you have carefully vetted. Now, when computers came along, there were problems with early mainframes because people discovered that there were all sorts of bugs in the operating system, which um, enabled people to uh, break access controls and get access to the whole machine when they weren't supposed to. And regardless of how many of these were fixed, more were quickly found. And so um, what happened in the 1960s was that if you had um, secret and top secret machines on an Air Force base, for example, then they would be kept in separate huts and the operator would have to log off one and then walk across the yard and show his pastor a chap with a rifle and go into the other hut. And, and, and work on the other machine, and this was a complete pain. And so a report was uh, commissioned from a chap called James Anderson, who recommended that with computers, you should try and keep security policy and enforcement simple. And um, this started the hunt for the security policy uh, that could um, deliver on this idea. Now, the levels of information in government include top secret, whose definition is that compromise could cost many lives or do exceptionally grave damage to operations, intelligence sources and methods, which of the Russian ciphers we're able to read at the moment, um, where our spies are in China, that sort of thing. Secret information is information whose compromise could threaten life directly, such as the performance of weapon systems. How noisy are our submarines when running at different speeds and at different depths? That's the kind of stuff that gets stamped secret. Confidential information is stuff whose compromise could damage operations, such as how much jet fuel we've got at a particular Air Force base. And things that are stamped official um, are usually things that um, should perhaps be in the public domain, but officials are unsure about it and they're concerned that a compromise might embarrass people. So given these levels, how it works is that resources such as documents, databases, um, things such as weapon systems have got classifications, and people and um, other principles that might access resources, such as um, software running on various machines, get clearances, and information flows upwards only. So this is how it looks. Information flows up from unclassified to confidential. People working at confidential level in the outer office are able to uh, browse the internet, but they're not able to upload anything confidential to an unclassified website. And then there's another gateway from there to secret, 
uh, where the secret information is kept more closely than the confidential information, typically on separate systems. And there's top secret stuff above that too. So how do you go about formalizing a policy of multi-level security? Well, the initial attempt was something called the Worldwide Military Command and Control System, which just said that no process could read a resource at a higher level. But this turned out to be not enough, because if people operating at top secret um, made a mistake, um, they could, for example, copy a top secret file down to a secret um, uh, location, and that meant that people with only a secret um, clearance could read it. And so they ended up having to run the whole worldwide military command and control system at top secret, which was inconvenient. So they um, called for better ideas, and in 1973, two guys called um, Dave Bell and Len LaPagela uh, came up with the following policy, and it's got two arms to it. The first is the simple security policy, which says that no one can read up, which is what we already had. And then their innovation was the star policy, which says that there's no write down. And the power of this is that they managed to prove a theorem saying that if these two properties held, uh, then a safe system stays safe. And so the idea was that you would use the bell Padula properties to minimize the trusted computing base that is the set of hardware, software, and procedures that could break the security policy in something that people started to call a reference monitor. And the idea is that the reference monitor would be um, a software component um, that would sit um, in the kernel and which would mediate file system accesses and I.O. so that you could um, ensure uh, that only a user who was logged on at top secret uh, would be able to read a secret file. And once that user had read the secret file, they would be stuck at the top secret level and they would be unable to write to a file that was just secret. Or if they did, then the file would be upgraded to top secret so that it was no longer available to people who merely had a secret clearance. That was the idea, that you could somehow enforce a multi-level secure uh, policy at the level of file system access. When people started to try and build systems that did this, and the first big attempt was Multix, um, a Honeywell system that was the precursor of modern Unix, they found that it was an awful lot harder than it looked, because a whole lot of processes such as memory management um, need to read and write at all levels. So they were put into the trusted computing base. And all of a sudden, it's not just the kernel. It's an awful lot of memory management and chunks of the file system as well. And then you end up having to put in things like backup and recovery and communications. And fairly soon, the trusted computing base grew to be a large part of the operating system. And it became too big to be easily verifiable. And then once people started deploying the first multi-level secure systems, they discovered that a whole lot of apps also needed to be multi-level secure. An example is a license server, because if you're using your system to design ships, for example, then when you design commercial ships, the uh, workstation might be running at confidential. But if it has to run at secure when you're designing a warship, then you've got the following sort of problem. Uh, somebody comes in and decides to do some work on a nuclear submarine. So they log on to AutoCAD, and the AutoCAD license server is then upgraded to um, secret. And this means that the guy down the corridor who's just working on designing an, uh, an oil tanker suddenly loses access to the tool. So you end up either having to design fancy multi-level secure license servers, which then have to be approved for use in government systems, or else you end up having to have separate systems to do computer-aided design at secret and also at confidential, which kind of vitiates the idea of having a multi-level secure system in the first place. One very interesting line of work that came out of the early um, research into multi-level security was uh, the topic of covert channels. In 1973, Butler Lamson argued that Bell Lepangela might not be practical because of covert channels, which he described as communication systems neither designed nor intended to carry information at all. Now, in a multi-level secure system, it's always assumed that malware at low can pass a copy of itself up to high because nothing stops um, things being sent from low to high. So if you're a low user, you write malware, 
um, you copy it up to high and once it's there it looks around for things that are of interest and signals back to its body at low. And one thing that it could do is to modulate a shared system resource. For example, it could fill the outer sector of the disk to signal a 1 and empty it to signal a 0. This is called a storage channel. Or much more practically, you could load the CPU, thereby getting a timing channel. And modern CPUs have got very high bandwidths and there's lots of speculation and um, other things going on there, which mean that timing channels can actually have remarkably um, large bandwidths. And we'll be discussing this later in the context of side channel attacks on uh, cryptographic implementations. Now, what can you do uh, about covert channels and about side channels? Well, um, as you'll recall from communications lectures, the capacity of a channel depends on bandwidth and on the signal to noise ratio. So you can either cut the bandwidth or increase the noise. And um, there are various things that you can do to do that, but you're very often limited by system architecture. And there'll be an awful lot more on that later. So how do you do a multi-level secure system in practice? Well, um, one of the classic ways of doing it is a pump, or also known as a data diode, which copies continuously um, stuff up from low to high with minimal covert channel leakage. Um, the kind of application that people talk about here when they're doing um, unclassified research papers is what happens if you have got a, a data storage system, say for an Air Force, with some tactical stores at low and a few secret stores at high, such as nuclear weapons. However, what people are mostly concerned about uh, is intelligence, because if you're running a wiretapping system like the um, NSA's um, systems for wiretapping fibers all over the world, um, then an opponent, say the Russians or the Chinese, can write some malware which they make available on optical fibers that they know will be tapped, and this malware then gets sucked up into your um, intelligence system, and if it's then got a powerful zero-day attack that enables it to take over the machines that it finds there, it can look for ways to signal home. And so you want very, very powerful, simple, hard to beat firewalls, uh, which will prevent the stuff that you've collected at high from signaling back outside to stuff at low. Further problems that you get with multi-level secure systems include composability. So if you've got a pump uh, that is reckoned to be good enough to separate secret information from top secret, or to separate unclassified information from secret, then you might find the following problem, that you've got one instance separating top secret from secret on the left, and then that secret corresponds um, with another secret on the right, which is separated again by your pump from unclassified. And so if somebody has got a, a way of defeating your pump, um, they can then send stuff from top secret all the way down to unclassified. And this is one example of a very general principle in security engineering, which is that the security properties of components do not in general compose. As soon as you connect two provably secure systems together, or even let one provably secure system have some feedback, then typically the security proof is voided. And so you have to be very careful about what you mean uh, by security proofs and arguments about security properties. Another issue that um, came up with um, multi-level security is consistency. Suppose, for example, um, you had a secret mission to send uh, missiles to Iran. Now, um, Iran is a destination under embargo, but back in the 1980s, President Reagan allowed one of his officials to send some missiles to Iran as part of some um, deal or other to get some hostages out of Lebanon or whatever. And when this eventually became public, it was a very serious embarrassment. So if you are trying to send missiles to Iran, you would definitely um, classify that mission as secret. And the American approach in that case is that that ship would be given a cover story. So there would be an unclassified manifest which said, untruthfully, that it was taking spares to Cyprus. Now, the complexity with that is that you might have somebody else in the naval dockyard says, aha, I've got a dozen um, 
jet engines that I need to, set, to send to Cyprus, let's put them on the ship. And then you either end up um, having to work out some excuse as to why the engines can't go on that ship, or else you end up having the engines going to the wrong place. The UK approach is that you just don't tell low users. So if we were sending missiles to Iran, then in the dockyard, um, people operating at the restricted level will be told that this is a classified cargo going to a classified destination. But then, of course, people know that something is afoot and they can gossip and they can speculate. So either way, there are downsides as to how you cover up um, the existence of classified things going on. So that gives us an oversight of multi-level security. And in the second part of this piece of the lecture, I'm going to talk about multilateral security. Because as we've seen with multi-level security, you're trying to stop stuff flowing from top secret down to secret, down to confidential, down to open. But there are other examples where you want to stop stuff flowing between different compartments. One example is intelligence. Uh, because if you have got some people who uh, are experts on what's going on in China and Iran and Brazil and South Africa and so on, you might want to give each of these analysts access to agent reports and intercepts from the area in question, but you don't want to let them see everything that's going on, because then if any of them become disloyal, you have uh, potentially uh, blown your whole um, infrastructure. Another example um, is competing clients of an accounting firm. There's only four large accounting firms, but there's more um, big oil companies than that. So how do you see to it that if um, you're um, Shell uh, and you're using PwC to advise you and um, takeovers or to do your audit, that the information that you give to the people at PwC doesn't leak to BP, who also use uh, PwC for other things? And a third example um, is, is medical records, because uh, what happens if um, any doctor could see any patient's records? Uh, at present, there are about 7,000 different general practices in the UK. And um, traditionally, um, medical record privacy was guaranteed by the fact that your records stayed in the practice or in the hospital. But as we computerize stuff, um, how do you see to it uh, that information doesn't leak across internal organizational boundaries? So this is a more difficult problem than multi-level security, and there's a number of different approaches to it. In intelligence agencies, you typically manage um, compartmented data, as they call it, by adding labels. So in addition to having unclassified data and secret data, you might have stuff that was secret plus a code word, for example, crypto. So if somebody wanted to understand how uh, cryptographic equipment worked at the secret level, they would need to have the secret clearance uh, and also to be indoctrinated into the label crypto. Similarly, um, if you had top secret crypto equipment, uh, then somebody would need a top secret clearance and also a, a crypto clearance in order to deal with that. And only some subset of the people at GCHQ might be authorized to talk to people in foreign countries about such things. And so you might have an extra indoctrination and extra label that they need. So this is traditionally how intelligence agencies have dealt with compartmented data that you ended up having to have extra labels to have access to particular operations or to particular sources and methods of information. You may recall in the previous lecture, there were um, top secret um, slides that had been leaked by Snowden with additional classifications like strap one and no foreign and so on and so forth. And how this is dealt with theoretically is because the Bell-LaPagula model requires only a partial order, not a total order. So everything we've got in terms of technical machinery and security proofs and so on can deal with lattices just as well as it can deal with hierarchies. As an example of what didn't work so well, um, you can consider the case of medical records. Back in 1996, when I started doing work, on medical privacy with the BMA. There were 11,000 different surgeries in the UK. And um, that meant that if somebody wanted to find out 
uh, the records of some particular celebrity, say you were an investigative journalist for the Daily Mail, you'd have to find out, first of all, which surgery they were at, and then you could try and phone up and social engineer people into disclosing uh, personal information. Now in 2021, uh, medical records, at least in England and Wales, are kept on three cloud services, and privacy is kept much less well. Um, in Scotland, there was a scandal uh, just over 10 years ago with something called the Emergency Care Record, uh, where the government in Holyrood decided to set up a centralised system with a summary of your GP record, which would be available to ambulance drivers, to paramedics, to out-of-hours medical services. And this was uh, basically putting um, all 5 million plus uh, medical records in Scotland into one pot. And pretty quickly, uh, there was a scandal in that a doctor in Montrose um, abused his right to access the system to look up the medical records of Gordon Brown, um, of Alex Salmon and of Kirsty Ward. And there was a great big scandal about that and eventually they decided it wasn't in the public interest to prosecute him. But that's the kind of thing uh, that, that, that you're worried about. Um, if you create a huge target in the form of 5 million people's medical records and you then make it necessary for 100,000 people to have access to those records in order to do their job, you can expect trouble. In England, uh, what's been done uh, with records there is a rule whereby you get access to records if your role requires record access and you have a relationship with the patient. And this failed at the coalface for the simple reason that very large numbers of people in the English NHS require access to records as a result of their role. Um, an example is a receptionist. A receptionist needs access to records so that she can um, ask you what your date of birth is to um, confirm your identity. That's the protocol that they use there. And um, if you are standing in front of this receptionist, then you've got a relationship with them. So they press the button saying, yes, I've got a relationship. And the result of this was that receptionists started being able to read things like um, confidential notes from psychiatric consultations. So there was a failure to think through what the actual requirements were for doing access control at scale um, once you started to put all the records into a pod. Now, um, in response to various scandals, the government in um, London allowed the English NHS uh, patients to have various opt-outs uh, from having their records shared for various purposes. But as soon as lots of people opted out, they tended to change the rules and opt everybody back in again. Very much like Facebook changes its privacy rules every year or two as soon as lots of people opt out of having their stuff sold to the advertisers. And there are various games around anonymization, which you'll have heard about in an earlier lecture. Anonymization of medical records is really hard because a typical medical record is a link between a number of things about you, some of which are public and others uh, of which are private. And if you know, for example, that Tony Blair that was treated for a heart murmur in Hammersmith Hospital on October the 3rd, 2003, uh, then you could simply look up a national medical record database to find that record, and then you know what pseudonym he's known by in the English NHS, and then you can find the rest of his stuff. So um, what can you realistically do to support research in um, big cloud services that hold medical records? And the answer that people are coming to is that you do the research in the cloud service itself. And the uh, COVID pandemic saw the development of what's called the Open Safely Project, whereby one of the big three cloud services with a total of 17 million patients is prepared to run inquiries on things of public interest that have been approved by an ethics committee. And this is how we got good figures on what the um, effects of various pre-existing medical conditions is on the likelihood that you'll get sick or, or die if you um, contract COVID. So that's a failure case, which I document in the book on the chapter on multilateral security. So what can we do um, that actually works? Well, um, if you work in an investment bank or an accountancy firm, then the rule tends to be that if you've worked for an oil company, say, then you can't work for a competing oil company for a certain um, 
gardening leave period, which might be two years. And so you will have a CV which said, um, at one level, um, I worked for between date X and date Y for um, an oil company. And then there'll be an internal document which says that between these two dates, John Smith um, worked for Exxon, and therefore he can't work for any other oil company until date Y plus two years. Another way of doing lateral flow controls is what you find in a retail bank, and this basically involves delegation. Now, the idea here is that the um, call center staff in a bank only get to see uh, your customer account details uh, once you've passed authentication. And this is why when you phone up uh, your bank, the um, ask you for the second letter and then the seventh letter of your password and whatever their authentication ritual is. The point is that that is not just authenticating you to the bank, it's giving permission to the call handler to access your records. And in this way, you prevent random call handlers uh, being able to go and look at the accounts of the rich and famous. However, that on its own isn't enough uh, because there are always people in the call center, such as supervisors who have to see everything. And so it's usually fortified with another defense, namely honeypots, um, whereby you have some accounts that the curious might want to look at in, in violation of the rules. So for example, um, if you are running an insurance company in America, you might have a complete set of entirely bogus medical records for the Kennedy family. And the sole function of having these on your system is so that you can detect and discipline any of your staff who look them up. Another twist on multi-level security is multi-level integrity. Just as the multi-level security module in Bell La Pagula allows information to flow only upwards uh, from low to high, there's another model called the Beaver model, which lets data flow only down from high integrity to low integrity. And so this is sometimes seen as the jewel of Bell La Pagula. And this is a means of limiting the damage that can be done by equipment failure or by operator error in safety critical systems. Here are two examples. In medical devices, you typically have a technician mode, which is used to calibrate the device, and then an operation mode, um, which is used by doctors when they use the thermometer to measure your temperature or use the ECG to measure your um, heart rhythm or whatever. And in order to get into the calibration mode, you need to bring along a special um, device, a smart card or whatever, which authenticates itself to the device and shows that you're an authorized technician from the manufacturer. A second example is in uh, utilities in electricity, gas and oil distribution, where you typically have several levels of safety and control in, for example, your grid. So at the highest integrity level is safety, and there are mechanisms there which will automatically shut things down if voltage, current or frequency uh, go outside um, uh, certain limits. So if you've got a, a bad lightning strike, for example, which causes an over voltage, then reclosers may blow and protect the network. And similarly, um, if the um, frequency of the grid um, goes uh, beyond certain limits, then other things will be done to either bring that within limits or to close down the grid. And this happens more or less regardless of what happens at the next level down. The next level down is one of monitoring and control, where you try and keep things under control. This is where the network control center is, is talking to the, the power stations and the substations and so on, and trying to see to it that you don't get into a condition where the safety controls would kick in and override. And then there's a lowest level, the enterprise apps, where you are billing the customer for the electricity that's used, or in the case of a pipeline for the gas or oil that's drawn off by a particular customer. Now, just as you have um, side channels in multi-level secure systems, um, you also have interference between safety monitoring and um, billing levels um, in gas and oil distribution. And a classic example here happened last year when ransomware operators um, hacked the colonial pipeline in the USA. 
and as a result, although they only hacked the billing system, the operator couldn't tell um, which of the customers were drawing um, how much fuel from the pipeline, and so they turned off the pipeline rather than ending up having to um, hand out hundreds of millions of dollars of fuel to people whom they couldn't bill. And this resulted in petrol stations all over the eastern USA going short of uh, fuel and um, huge big queues and disruption. And it was almost getting to the point where the federal government would have ordered them to turn on the pipeline and keep the fuel flowing, regardless of the fact that they couldn't bill properly for it. So here too, there are limits to what you can do in terms of separating information at different levels, or for that matter, in different compartments. The third type of security policy that we're interested in in this lecture is the security policies that we use when we're trying to prevent internal fraud. And if you've ever visited the British Museum in London, you may have seen this exhibit here of a bulla, which is the earliest known instance of a fraud prevention device. This goes back over 5,000 years to ancient Nineveh. And back in those days, when people had just discovered agriculture and started living in small cities, one of the problems they needed to solve was how could you prove um, how much wheat or how much wine you had put in the village storehouse the previous um, autumn when you went in hungry in February or March and tried to get it out again. And the solution that they came up with was the idea of a bulla, um, a little clay model of an amphora of wine or a bag of wheat. And if you put in three amphora of wine and three bags of wheat, um, the, the, then the um, storehouse keeper would give you three of these little uh, tokens, bully, which would be pressed into a ball of clay, which would then be fired. So this was your tamper resistant receipt for the food and drink that you had stored. And uh, you could go and collect what was due to you. Move on a few thousand years to about a thousand years ago. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, people started struggling with the idea of how you manage a business that's become too large to staff with your own family members. And the invention that people come up with then was double entry bookkeeping, where the idea is that each entry in one ledger is matched by opposite entries in another. So for example, if a firm sells hundred pounds worth of goods on credit, then you credit your sales account by hundred pounds and you debit the receivables account by hundred pounds. So the total amount of money on the books is still the same, uh, but the um, transaction has been reflected on two different ledgers. And then when the customer pays, you credit the receivables account and you debit the cash account. And this means that you can have the books kept by different members of staff and you can balance up each of the parts of the operation so that the cashier, for example, can at the end of the day count up the amount of money that's in the till and balance that against the cash account. And the idea here is that your staff have to collude in order to get away with fraud. And here from Cambridge University Library um, is the first evidence of um, double entry bookkeeping, which is a Hebrew manuscript from 1100 AD that was dug out of, of an old synagogue in Cairo. Um, later on, this spread via Venice to Western Europe, and it became the standard uh, for doing bookkeeping um, for um, hundreds of years after that. In fact, it's still the standard, although now it's implemented in uh, computing equipment as much as in paper books. So here, for example, is 1870, the bills office at the uh, Bank of England. Uh, this is basically how you did computing in the old days with a parallel array of CPUs um, in the form of young men, uh, clerks, uh, who would work out how much interest in this case was due in various notes. And um, they had algorithms uh, back in the day for sorting and searching and reconciling. And most important of all, doing error correction. Because when people are doing transactions by hand, you tend to have an error rate of something like one in 500 transactions. And you've got to be able to identify these and make them good. So um, what is your security policy in somewhere like a bank? Well, the threat model is that um, perhaps 1% of staff go bad each year in the, in the sense of committing some fraud or embezzlement or whatever. As I mentioned, you get mistakes as well, perhaps one in 500 paper transactions. There are clever fraudsters too, who try and figure out ways of hacking the system. 
And if you've got loss of public confidence, that can mean ruin for a bank because people could go to the bank and ask for their money back. So your protection goals are to deter and prevent the obvious frauds, to detect the rest as soon as possible, and to be able to defend the bank's actions in court. So how do you turn this into a security policy model? Well, the seminal paper was written by a computer scientist, David Clark from MIT, and an accountant, David Wilson, in 1986 to model real bookkeeping systems. And the idea, as they presented it, was that in addition to the normal objects in your system, which they call unconstrained data items, you add constrained data items, um, which you might think of as being, for example, bank balances. Now, these constrained data items are acted on by special programs called transformation procedures. And the, the mental model here is that a transformation procedure in a bank or in a bookkeeping system must increase the balance in one account by the same amount that it decrements another. So this is an IT way of implementing what was invented in, in the Eastern Med a thousand years ago. And so here's the framework. You've got an integrity validation procedure to validate CDI integrity. In other words, you've got a way of balancing the books. You have a, an invariant in that applying a transformation to a constrained data item maintains its integrity. And along with that is the demand that a constrained data item can only be changed by a transformation procedure. So nobody has got some binary editor which allows him to go into the disk and just change the balance available in his account and somebody who did would find that the bank didn't balance and that an alarm was set off and processing was stopped. You also have access controls which mean that subjects can use only certain transformation procedures and certain constrained data items and the triples of subject transformation and constrained data item enforce separation of duty. So these enable you to write and implement a policy such as a transaction over a million dollars must be authorized by both a, a branch accountant and a branch manager. The next point is that certain transformation procedures act on unconstrained data items to produce CDIs as output. In other words, you've got a way of inputting data in a trustworthy way. So somebody turns up at your bank branch and hands over um, $100 in notes you've got a way of generating a constrained data item in the form of a debit in one account and a, a credit in another account, uh, plus as an external mechanism to count up the amount of physical cash you've got in the safe at the end of the day. The next point is that you can do auditing in that each application of a transformation procedure writes enough information to an audit, audit trail CDI to reconstruct its action. And in a typical bank, how this works um, is that the system is designed so that you can reconstruct um, what the bank was at any day in the past three or four months. And you also have logs which enable you with a little bit more effort to reconstruct what the state of the bank was at any time in the past seven years. And the reason for these uh, limits um, are that seven years is the period of time during which the bank can conceivably be sued for debts by um, its customers and, and other counterparties. You've got authentication too, in that the system authenticates subjects initiating a transformation procedure, and only special subjects, namely security officers, can set up and alter triples. So this is the framework. How do you go about using it in practice? Well, um, if you're called on to design internal controls uh, for a company so that you can separate uh, duties, then there are two ways of doing it in serial and in parallel. Now, everyday transactions tend to have control organized sequentially. So, for example, um, if a university lecturer or professor gets money in from a research council such as AppCircle or from a charity, then that ends up going in the university's uh, pot uh, and the lecturer gets uh, an account saying you've got so and so much money in your account. Uh, grant number so and so. If you then want to buy a, a server, for example, I get the finance officer to register a supplier if they don't already have a suitable supplier, and, and, and then I get the, the stores people to sign an order form and send it to the supplier. So the server arrives and the stores receives the goods, 
and they check that it's okay. They look at the box and they call me and say, you know, shall we send this up to the machine room or whatever? And the department gets an invoice, which is sent to finance division. Once the delivery has been checked, um, uh, finance asks me whether we should pay the invoice and we say, yeah, we got the server and it's working. And then I get a statement of the money that's left on the grant. And every so often there's an audit by the grant giver and by the university and others. And this enables the university and the grant giving body to get some reasonable amount of assurance that I haven't just stuck the money in my pocket and you know use it to um, pay for an expensive holiday in the Caribbean. So that's how separation of duties works with normal serial transactions. However, where the transaction is large or where it's irre irreversible, as in a bank guarantee, you typically have two signatures. So you may have a rule saying that transactions over a certain amount need to be signed uh, by two senior people or two directors of a company or whatever. What theory is there behind this? Well, um, there's quite a lot, but it tends to be um, in that part of economics, um, which is to do with the economics of organizations. And so professors of accountancy, for example, um, uh, write papers and do research about how employees optimize their own utility rather than their employers. This is the agency problem, how managers feather their own nests rather than maximizing profit for shareholders. And so you need internal controls that mitigate not just fraud, but nepotism and empire building. And as well as the sticks, you need carrots. Uh, nowadays, uh, most companies have got bonus schemes and stock options, particularly for directors, so that you align the interests of directors with the interests of shareholders by allowing them to buy a certain number of shares every year at a certain price. So if they increase the, the share price of the company, the, their bonus ends up being bigger. And there are various corporate governance rules. You may hear of Sir Bans Oxley in America and Cadbury in UK, which set the tone. And then you've got big accountancy firms which drive good practice uh, by having um, lists of hundreds and hundreds of things that other companies do. And then um, applying these as they go around from one um, customer to another, uh, basically saying, well, every other oil company is now using such and such a process. Why don't you too? So the process is basically an evolutionary one where ideas of internal control spread through the industry as a result of action by um, accountants and consultants. How does this system fail? Well, um, there's been a number of spectacular failures which have tended to condition the way in which internal control is done. There was a famous fraud by McKesson and Robbins in 1938 where a company that was quoted on the stock market in Wall Street turned out to be largely bogus uh, because the people who ran it had invented a large part of their accounts. They had fictitious trading partners and they claimed to own a bank in Montreal that didn't exist. After that, laws were brought in by most stock markets saying that to have your shares quoted on a stock market, you needed to have your books audited by an independent firm of accountants. And in countries like America and Britain, this also became the law. But it didn't entirely fix the problem because we had a similar scandal in 2020 with a firm called Wirecard, um, basically a fintech, which claimed to have a whole lot of assets in the Far East, which turned out to not exist. And um, this became very politicized because Wirecard was one of the darlings of the German stock market. And when journalists of the Financial Times started pointing out that their accounts didn't add up, the German stock market um, threatened to sue and indeed to prosecute uh, the journalists at the Financial Times for defaming the good name of German commerce and a notable German company. Uh, they ended up getting egg on their faces for that one. So enforcement of internal control practice tends to be cyclical and it can sometimes be politicized. So what do you do if you find yourself having to design internal controls? Well, you do some kind of systematic, systematic analysis whereby you trace the worst outcomes. Uh, in other words, your threat model back along the workflow. Um, that gives you a, a top-down approach. And then there's also a bottom-up approach where you look for the greatest opportunities for individual staff. And one of the things that you can do there is go and talk to staff of different categories to um, account staff to store staff and so on and, and ask them 
how would you go about ripping off this company? And, you know, if you can do this over a cup of tea or over a beer and, and do it nicely, they'll often say, well, you know, um, the system is obviously uh, broken here because I could do X and then Y and then Z and nobody would catch me. And so if you're doing good security engineering, you know, you have to go out and talk to people uh, because often the people who work for a company are the people who know where the vulnerabilities are. And it really is a good idea to talk to them. And the philosophy here is that um, if you want fraud to not happen, you have to deter, you have to prevent, you have to detect, you have to alarm, uh, you have to delay, and you have to respond. And where you put the emphasis will depend on the type of fraud uh, that you're worried about and that you wish to mitigate. So what lessons are there to be learned? Well, there's no single solution to the insider threat. We considered three um, broad categories where multi-level security policies um, uh, were developed, basically thanks to the military and the intelligence community. The idea is that even if you get a dishonest insider in the form of malware sitting on one of the servers at the heart of your intelligence service, it should simply not be able to signal what is learned uh, back to its uh, master in Russia or China or wherever. And we noted that multi-level security can be used for safety or integrity as well as, uh, as for secrecy. Multilateral policies are basically there to mitigate the effects of scale, to see to it that you don't have every one of the million people who work for the NHS in Britain able to see all of the records of all the 60 million people in Britain all at the same time. Uh, you have to have some way uh, of seeing to it that people who are dishonest or who are um, careless or whose PCs get taken over by malware uh, cannot thereby cause disastrous things to happen. And the third um, case that we looked at is integrity policy and this was driven by commercial IT security and inspired by bookkeeping. There what we're trying to do is to ensure that even if um, the finance director of your company um, has her PC taken over by means of uh, some nasty piece of malware, the amount of damage that it will do can reasonably be limited. And in order to design these systems, you have to look at real world systems in real world contexts. And there's an awful lot of experience of doing this, uh, some of which I've managed to capture in the security engineering book chapters um, on multi-level security, multilateral security and uh, banking and bookkeeping.